Good morning, my friends. This is Paul, and today I'm going to be talking about how the heck I got so many friends, and I'm an antisocial homeschooler, so that should be impossible, right? I guess I've created a paradox in the universe because homeschoolers aren't allowed to have so many friends. Yet, I think I have way more friends than just about anyone I know, or at least very good friends, because... I think some people who actually went to school most of their lives probably have more friends on a quantifiable level, but I don't know how many of them are such good friends that you could trust them with anything. Our soulmates happen to have the ultimate, amazing, on top of the world experiences with their hangouts. Definitely not the type of people that you just text them to say good morning to and, and leave it at that. So. I'm not pretending to be an expert or a therapist or someone who studied the art of making friends. I'm just here to talk about my personal experience and hopefully that'll work for you or at the very least just in case you're the type that has trouble with socialization or were homeschooled yourselves and you do believe in the stereotypes that homeschoolers aren't supposed to be social. Maybe you can learn from me and say, oh, Paul can do it. I can do it too. So one of the first things that I did to make as many friends as I did is I carefully selected friends that, for the most part, shared the same values as me. I didn't just go along and say, oh, that girl's pretty. I'm just going to talk to her because of that. I legitimately sat down and thought to myself, is this person, generally speaking, a good person? And do they have a good moral code? And do they, generally speaking, value the same things that I do? Now, that's not to say all of my friends are 100% in agreement with every single thing that I believe. I think if that were to be the case, then the world would be a pretty boring place. But most of my friends, at the very least, acknowledge the same fundamental beliefs that I do. They believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They believe that he was God. He wasn't just uh, a prophet. They believe that he died on the cross for our sins, but they also believe in common courtesy and common decency. A lot of them believe in saving sex for marriage. A lot of them did save sex for marriage if they were married, and the ones that didn't repented, and then after they repented, they remained chaste until they got married. So generally speaking, pretty much all of my friends share that consensus. And it really helped that because those shared values were in common, we could talk about really deep things and I could really trust their advice because they weren't coming from a worldly standpoint. They weren't coming from trying to just blindly follow the crowd. They were coming from, this is the right thing to do. And the advice I'm going to give you isn't just my opinion. It's based on morality itself. So that's one huge factor. Another thing is joining youth groups and young adult groups were huge in expanding my friend circle. In fact, my brother is now married to one of our mutual friends from our high school youth group. So if that isn't a sign of success, I don't know what is. Going to youth group and young adult group, um, basically it helped me to really understand, especially how females worked, because I didn't have a whole lot of female friends during my childhood and that rapidly changed after I got into youth group because I didn't really know any teenage girls at that point and so a lot of what they went through and some of the biological changes were completely unknown to me so this was my opportunity to really get to know the other sex and learn like oh okay okay, so this is how they think, this is what they don't like, this is what they like, and so just generally getting more of an observatory feel, because I had two younger brothers and a younger sister, and at the time I was in youth group, my sister, well, she was still pretty darn young, so I didn't have a chance to say, dearest sister of mine, tell me how teenage girls work. Now, that didn't work, and even so, my sister t doesn't really like associating with with too many girls to begin with but that's another story the point is that in a youth group setting you felt a lot safer and I felt more like 
Well, not entirely. I had some miserable times in youth group, but for the most part, I felt like I could be myself and people would really, really like that about me. But way better than youth group was young adult groups. Those were essentially paradise on earth because they felt like the best parts of the mission trips and conferences I went on condensed into a couple of hours. And these people were generally speaking a lot more mature. Um, when I went to youth group, there were definitely some moments that nearly caused me to lose faith in humanity and they caused me to become very, very sexist and sexist and prejudiced. And joining young adult groups, I didn't feel I didn't feel like these people were out to get me as much as the people in the youth group were. And so I definitely think that if you happen to be a minor watching this, which is highly unlikely given my YouTube statistics, then I would say if you think that youth group just isn't for you, just wait a couple of years until you turn 18 or older and you will see a night and day difference in how these people process information. Another one of my big tactics for having a good friend circle is not following YouTube advice on how to grow your channel. <clears throat> now I know that there are, are um, I know that there are ambitious people out there and there are certain tactics that they need to use in order to grow their platform because they're planning on making their platform a business. And I have mixed feelings on that. <clears throat> on one hand, you take someone like Scott the Waz, who is insanely popular but he never asks for likes or subscribes. He never has sponsorships. He doesn't even have like an ad or a paid promotion. He just talks about what he likes. He has consistent humor. And generally speaking, I think he could prove to be a good example of how to be popular on YouTube without taking the advice of what YouTube says you have to do, of saying, in every video that you have to like and subscribe. I have deliberately avoided a lot of that advice because there are many reasons, but to put it simply, I just don't think that an arbitrary number is a quantifiable... To rephrase it, I don't think that numbers equal friendships. If I theoretically have a million subscribers, but I only talk to two on a regular basis, I'm actually going to consider that a failure as a YouTuber. So by just being myself and if people like it then cool, that allows me to really have conversations with the people on my YouTube channel and those people that I do have conversations with, some of them I've even exchanged numbers with and they join me on my live streams and a lot of them have proven to be just as amazing as a lot of my in-person friends. Maybe not to the depths of where my in-person friends go above and beyond for me, but they probably would if they could see me a lot more frequently. So I'm, I'm not saying you have to do that, but I would say that if you do the usual thing of like and subscribe and share this video, that that's gonna be more so of making your channel successful, but I don't know if it'll get you long-term really good friends. Uh, the final bit of advice I want to give you guys is, I think, one of the best ways of making long-lasting, deep, wonderful friends, as opposed to just surface-level friends, would be to not go into it looking for romance. See, a lot of people... When they reach a certain age, they become desperate to date and to have experience. And some people even want to settle down and find the perfect husband slash the perfect wife. And while that's definitely good, and I'm not anti-marriage by any means, I also think that that can put a hindrance on your relationships. Because let's say that you take that approach and you go into a relationship with the opposite gender looking for getting into a long-term romantic relationship that isn't just platonic. And maybe it will work out, but then say things don't work out. Generally speaking, when I've talked to people that have taken that approach, 
that friendship just goes out the window and then they never talk to that person again and if they do it's like insanely awkward and it's usually obligatory like you might have say a child in a split marriage and then the marriage falls to pieces and then you have to split the custody between the child and it's a really unfortunate reality if you go into a relationship looking for I don't know be it sex be it romance to save sex for marriage either way if there's not the intention of having a long-lasting connection first and foremost it might end up backfiring on you and that's why even though I don't really rule anyone out per se I usually don't go into my friendships looking for something more I usually go into it looking for a long-lasting connection and that's why a lot of my friendships that ended up where the other person was dating or got married or both it didn't really affect our friendship all that much besides the frequency of our hangouts tended to be a little bit less this painting is one of the perfect examples of where non-jealousy came into play and provided one of the best friendships ever that was given to me by my friend Kara at the time I was in a serious relationship with my ex and she was single and she still gave me that picture anyway as a sign of how much she valued our friendship now our positions are reversed where she's married and I'm single but yet she still hasn't asked me to change my profile picture on Facebook, which has the two of us smiling at the camera. And we're still planning to do a friendversary celebration, just like what I did with Danielle. So because, because we valued the deep connection first and foremost, we were able to stay the best of friends. And by best of friends, I mean like, my gosh, the things Kara has been able to do for me and hopefully me to her have just been so astronomical that you'd say, say what? How is it possible that a homeschooler can get that deep of a connection? All that without, without really needing any inappropriate physical intimacy or anything like that. It just happened to be first and foremost we want to help each other get to heaven. We want to support each other's needs. And we care about each other as people first before we think about the body. So those are just a couple of my tips. I could mention, of course, all the retreats and conferences and mission trips I've been on. But only a handful of those people actually became a lifelong amazing friends. One of which is now one of my pen pals. But I'll save that for the best memories of the year list. Just saying that hopefully these tips are just good for relationships in general. And if they don't work, then it could be that maybe you need to develop a sense of common courtesy. If you're just the type of person that just goes into a conversation just saying like, Hey, I like Yu-Gi-Oh! Instead of saying things like, Hi, and nice to meet you and asking about the other person's interests, then you're basically shooting yourself in the foot. So with that, thank you very much for watching. If I haven't made myself 100% clear, or if you think that I should give more advice or make a part two, let me know down in the comment section. And until the next time, keep the faith, stay epic, God bless, and I hope that those of you watching this can have a long-term connection with me as well. Bye!